So if, it, if it's uh, suitable, I'd like to uh, begin the listening session. Uh, and I'm looking to staff to get the big uh, nods, if you don't mind. That's a big thumbs up. All and right, the thumbs up there. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome everybody. Um, it's it's a pleasure to have you all here at the welcome at the at the listening session. This is the third of three. Um, as I uh, looked at those notes from that, I remember uh, the second one was uh, the night before COVID started on March 13th in Kern County, and uh, um, here we are, a long way down the road with a much different change of pace, much different uh, outlook for all of us as we face this pandemic. And um, I'm so pleased that we have the technology that allows us to open uh, this venue tonight and uh, listen to all of you as you help us on our path of continuous improvement at the BSCC. My name is Linda Penner. Um, there are board members with us tonight that I will introduce in just a moment. But before I do that, I wanted to make a few introductory remarks and uh, beginning with the obvious, which is we're here to hear from you tonight. We want to improve our county jails throughout the states, our juvenile uh, detention facilities throughout the state. And uh, by listening carefully to the public and their desires and their concerns, I think we can um, uh, assimilate that into our policies and practices. We um, have that core uh, mission of inspections, uh, both on the juvenile and the adult side. And you know that uh, many of you know, but I'll remind you that in January of this year, the governor uh, specifically directed the board uh, to more actively engage counties regarding deficiencies identified as part of this inspection process through public board meetings um, and to follow up on uh, deficiencies identified. The board will also provide additional technical assistance to those counties where issues are in identified and also in part of that uh, Title 15 jail review standards, the board will make sure the standards are consistent with nationwide best practices. We've made substantial progress towards this uh, directive of the governor. And uh, we'll talk about that as soon as I finish my remarks uh, in just a few minutes. But we specifically tonight wanna hear input for you, from you about possible uh, improvements as you see it. Uh, there are many, many interested stakeholders on the call tonight, and I appreciate you being here to offer your input from the perspective of both professional and lived experienced individuals. The meeting will be recorded and the input will be analyzed after the meeting. Uh, the board meets in February of 2021 and we will receive a report that summarizes what we hear this evening. Tonight is an opportunity for us to listen. Uh, we don't anticipate having a discussion or uh, responding to suggestions except to clarify questions uh, so we understand and digest what you intended us to understand and digest. As I mentioned, there are board members on the call tonight and I would call attention to Gordon uh, Barranco. I see Gordon there, give us a wave, who's on the call. Norma Kupian's on the call, I think uh, she'll just give us a wave and Chief Kelly Zuniga is on the call. A wave from her would be great. Thanks to those med board members for being here tonight. And I Linda, also want to, yes. Uh, David Steinhardt is here as well. Just oh, wanted to be sure. Did he make it? Okay, yeah, David, David made it, yeah. Thank you for remembering me, thank you. Well, we remembered you, but you said you were gonna be tardy and I didn't wanna call you out if you were, weren't actually there yet. So thank you for making it. Um, we've seen a lot of David all day today. So good to see you again. Um, I want to acknowledge, take a minute to acknowledge uh, Kathleen Howard and uh, in-house counsel Aaron McGuire. Uh, there's a whole lot of heavy lifting that goes on around the BSCC and uh, those two, um, unlike many others, appear in every meeting, for every discipline, for every uh, uh, endeavor the BSCC takes on. And I so appreciate the two of you for doing that. On this specific task, we have Allison Ganter who has uh, spent hours and hours of time specifically on this evening and that's just part of her job. So we so appreciate you and your staff as you do that. 
Tracy Cohn, our communication director, is here with us tonight. She moves the agenda so those of you in the public have this common exchange that we value so very much. Adam Lewin, uh, who's our administrative uh, person that keeps uh, many of us afloat by uh, keeping us on task and true to our schedules. And we thank Adam very much for all of his input. And I think Ginger's here. Ginger does uh, all kinds of heavy lifting and keeps a smile on her face. So let me just appreciate and thank all of you for everything you've done for this evening and everything you've done uh, for months preparing for this new inspection process. There's the inspectors themselves that are out there. Our um, team is um, busy and having to learn to do things in a time that uh, confounds many of us. And I appreciate each of them. With that said, um, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Allison. I think we're gonna go silent, which is um, no lack of disrespect, but uh, better to listen when not talking. And um, Allison, I see you already have your PowerPoint up. She's grabbed the screen and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks, Allison. Thank you so much, Linda. I want to welcome everyone uh, to the listening session. Uh, in a moment, I will share very specific instructions for how we're going to take public comment. Um, I really do appreciate everyone taking the time to participate this evening. Uh, I do want to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded. It will be made available on the BSCC website um, after this evening, so um, individuals who aren't able to attend will be able to to view this and also I want to encourage people if they have comments to make in writing if they weren't able to attend um, we'll put the the email address up in the chat at some point but it's regulations at bscc.ca.gov just to let people know I want to spend um, just a very short period of time going over um, some of the BSCC's authority just to set a little bit of context for what we're going to be um, listening to um, public comment on. So I'll just very briefly, I'm sharing my screen, hopefully everybody can see and just go through a couple, couple of slides here to get us started. Um, both the penal code and the welfare and institutions code require the BSCC to develop regulations for the operation and for the construction of local detention facilities. The penal code does require us to review and if necessary revise every two years the um, adult regulations we do apply that same standards to our juvenile minimum standards and just again for context when we talk about regulations. When we talk about the board um, going ahead and adopting regulations, they are contained in Title 15 of the California Code of Regulation. Uh, Code of Regulations, specifically, Title 15 refers to the operational regulations. Title 24 are the um, regulations that apply to the design and construction of local detention facilities. Again, for context. The authority for our biennial inspections is also located um, in the penal code um, for adult detention facilities and in the welfare and institutions code for juvenile halls and camps. And a brief uh, note about process for our inspections that are conducted biennially. The steps that we take is that we do review agency policy and procedure to ensure that there is or to verify compliance with Title 15 regulations, again, the operational regulations. We conduct a thorough on-site review of documentation related to the Title 15 requirements. What we're looking to see is that um, practices align not only with Title 15 requirements, but also with agency policies and procedures. Um, we do spend time in the facility. We interview persons that are housed inside the detention facilities, also custodial staff, and we'll also spend time talking with um, ancillary staff, um, individuals that aren't necessarily um, custody staff, but do work with the individuals inside um, the detention facilities. And as a note, um, when we do walk around the facilities, we don't schedule the inspections um, with individuals. We tend to um, talk with um, people as we walk around, um, walk around the individual units. Um, and finally, um, 
A really important part is walking around each local detention facility, observing all aspects of the physical plant to um, verify compliance with Title 24. Again, the, the building standards for the design and construction of local detention facilities. Um, the enhanced inspection process is the process that we're here talking about tonight. Um, and as we've talked about before, it is intended to implement the governor's direction to enhance oversight um, and strengthen the state's oversight um, of jails. And the intent is also to provide increased transparency in the inspection process. And that's going to include regular updates to our BSCC board on facility non-compliance status. Um, board members are going to have the opportunity at each board meeting to discuss um, items of non-compliance and the circumstances surrounding them. We've been talking specifically about significant items of non-compliance that will come before the board for discussion. And in certain cases, um, we will ask that facility administrators do come before the board to address um, items of non-compliance. A change in our inspection process is that we will be providing an initial inspection report at the close of our on-site um, inspections um, so that when we leave the facility, the agencies will have notice of outstanding items of non-compliance, which will start a clock. Um, agencies will have 30 days from the time of inspection to correct those items of non-compliance or submit a corrective action plan outlining how those items of non-compliance will be addressed. Those agencies submitting a corrective action plan will, out, will have to outline how the items will be corrected within 60 days of BSCC's receiving that plan. And again, agencies receive, uh, failing to submit those plans or failing to correct items of non-compliance will be asked to, um, excuse me, sorry, technology. Um, the last piece of that, um, agencies failing to submit the corrective action plan or correct those items within 60 days of receipt of the corrective action plan will be requested to come before the BSCC board. Um, again, just to provide some context on our listening session and the enhanced inspection process this evening, um, give me one second to switch to my other screen and I will go over how we're going to accept public comment this evening. So again, I want to encourage um, individuals to please go ahead and submit written comments to the email um, regulations at bscc.ca.gov. We do have some individuals who have written in advance and let us know that they would like to speak this evening. So we would like to take a moment, um, if you would like to um, provide public comment, if you could please just put your name in the chat and we will begin setting up a queue. So just give us a minute or two to get that list organized. As soon as we have our list built, we'll work down um, the list in order that we receive um, names. We will be keeping this meeting open until at least 8 p.m. Um, we're gonna make sure that we hear all of the comments from individuals who would like to make one. Um, if you don't put your name in right now and you choose to make a comment later at 7.55, that is okay. There will be opportunity throughout this meeting for everybody to make a comment. So thank you, I see some, some names coming into the chat. Um, just give us one more minute. Allison, um, this is Adam. We currently have seven members in the queue. So um, whenever you're ready, let me know or let Ginger know. Excellent. Yes. And we'll be monitoring the queue. So we will um, get started here. And again, just please continue to put your name in the chat and we will make sure that your comments are heard. So we are asking that individuals keep comments to around two minutes. Um, we will absolutely allow individuals to complete their thoughts um, and we will be flexible, but we're asking that individuals please be mindful of that two minute limit. When you're called upon to speak, please eliminate any background noises um, before you unmute your microphone. Um, we also have the, the raise hand feature. Um, so if you do raise your hand, um, we'll, we'll catch you and we'll put you in the queue and we'll lower your hand when we've placed you there. 
I don't know that we have anybody on who's calling in from the phone, um, but you can uh, dial star nine to raise your hand if you're on the phone and we'll call out your phone number if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to make a comment. And when you do begin speaking, if you could please um, begin your comment with, the, with your name and with the organization that you are representing. So with all of that being said, the first person that I have um, that I'll please ask to speak is uh, Avalon Edwards. And after that, we have Sue Burrell. Um, Avalon? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Avalon Edwards and I'm a policy fellow with Starting Over Inc. I was introduced to the BSCC at the beginning of my fellowship with Starting Over in June of this year. At the time, I was told that the BSCC is an agency that provides oversight to the county jails in California. As I have continued working with the families of those incarcerated in Riverside County jails and learned about the condi conditions that have persisted inside, I have learned that this isn't true. An oversight agency would ensure that incarcerated people receive soap and masks on a regular basis during the spread of a deadly pandemic. An oversight agency would not take a sheriff who has scoffed at the seriousness of the coronavirus at his word when he claims his jails are regularly testing those in custody. An oversight agency would have regular unannounced inspections of county facilities where inspectors have private one-on-one -on -one conversations with the incarcerated people experiencing the conditions that are being inspected. An oversight agency would require all counties to report their COVID statistics rather than allowing some to slip through the cracks without consequence. An oversight agency would identify dangerous jail conditions and demand that they be addressed immediately rather than within a dangerously lenient 90 day time period. I know this is not an oversight agency because no one from the BSCC has stepped foot in a Riverside County jail since the onset of COVID-19 in March. This agency has been aware of inhumane and dangerous conditions in Riverside County jails for months. Because of a complete absence of oversight, four people are dead. Their names were Edward Thomas Clark, Salvador Jesus Garcia, David Worksman, and Terrell Young. They got sick in jails where the sheriff was and still is getting away with denying PPE and COVID tests to those in his custody, where deputies don't wear their masks and people inside are spending 23 hours per day locked in their cells. There was no oversight. There was no one watching and there still isn't. According to the BSCC's own data, 87 people in the Riverside County jail system tested positive for COVID last week. Edward Thomas Clark, Salvador Jesus Garcia, David Worksman, Terrell Young. These four men are dead and 622 others have contracted COVID-19 in Riverside jails because, of a rogue, because a rogue sheriff has been allowed to play with the lives of his employees and those in his custody. The BSCC has now delayed its Riverside facilities inspection twice. The longer this agency fails to provide consistent, thorough, and meaningful inspections of California's county jails, the more lives will be endangered during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ginger, um, we have Sue Burrell next, and after Sue. After Sue, we have Lou Lasco. Thank you. Sue? Hi, I, th I timed this, I think it's three minutes, so bear with me, I ho hope this is okay. Um, Madam Chair and members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm Sue Burrell, I'm the Policy Director for the Pacific Juvenile Defender Center with Elizabeth Calvin of Human Rights Watch and Shannon Wilbur of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, I submitted written comments specifically on the juvenile inspection process. California needs a credible oversight system over county facilities. While the proposed changes to the inspection process should be approved and implemented, the fundamental flaws in the existing process will not be resolved by shortening the time for corrective action or posting inspection reports more quickly. The real problem with our inspection process is that it's fine for facilities where officials are willing to do the right thing, but it does not work well when, um, when officials are unwilling or unable to make needed changes. Our state regulations are widely interpreted as not being enforceable, including by the Attorney General, and the ultimate threat of bringing a county facility in front of the board is unwieldy and historically ineffective. The crisis that captured 
Governor Newsom's attention last year included rampant violence, mistreatment of mentally ill people, and suicides in jail. And more recently, as we've just heard, the COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the need for comprehensive regulations and protocols to protect incarcerated people, staff, and the greater community. These are issues calling for stronger regulations, a more robust, proactive, and responsive inspection process, and more effective sanctions than we have. Um, for, uh, Governor Newsom called for the regulations to reflect national standards, and there's nothing that I've seen in the proposed changes to assure that this will happen. The inspection process itself needs to be more responsive to complaints and emerging issues arising between the two-year inspections, and it needs the flexibility to do unannounced visits and investigations. Um, also, while the juvenile regulations call for facilities to have both a written policy and to implement it, a review of the inspection reports themselves indicates that the primary review is whether there's a written policy. Inspections need to focus more on observation and teams should be expanded to include subject matter experts and people with whom youth will feel comfortable talking about their experiences. The practice of relying on self-reporting on some issues should be discontinued. Gaps in the regulations must be addressed, including program and physical plant requirements for long-term confinement and comprehensive provisions for emergency response in situations like COVID-19 and the recent wildfires. Existing regulations should be expanded to provide more specificity about what exactly is required to meet minimum standards. We urge BSCC to coordinate with the newly created Office of Youth and Community Restoration to address these issues. That agency is tasked with providing leadership to the field and also with playing an investigative role in facility conditions issues. Although BSCC has long used a consensus-based model for regulations development, that model has not adequately protected youth from harm or counties from liability. We hope that the efforts to, to improve inspections will continue, and we look forward to continued discussion of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Um, just want to remind people, um, if you're joining in, I see a few people joining, if you could um, put your name in the chat if you'd like to speak at any time. And if you're on the phone, you can um, hit star nine um, or raise your hand and we'll um, call you out by your phone number and get you into the queue. Um, if people would like to send in written comments, again, regulations at bscc.ca.gov. Um, and up next, we have Luis Nolasco. And after uh, Luis, we have Miguel Garcia. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Luis Nolasco. I'm here on behalf of ACLU of Southern California, Riverside, all of us for none, and Severino Freedom Mall. Uh, we thank the BSEC for this opportunity to provide public input into these inspections. Um, but, you know, we feel that some of these are a little too late. Um, as you know, th these opportunities should have existed uh, earlier in the pandemic rather than waiting about eight months or so uh, for COVID to ravage our communities. So, uh, you know, a big concern for our groups in the inland region is the current process by which inspections are taking place. Uh, we do not believe that scheduling inspections will allow the BSCC to truly understand everything occurring inside facilities on a day to day basis. Unannounced inspections are what must happen if inspectors are to see jail for what it is and not the cleanup version that is often presented. We know there's a numerous amount of violations occurring in Riverside and San Bernardino County jails based on the correspondence we have with individuals and their families. These conditions only worsen during COVID-19 at the hands of both of the sheriff's departments. This is not a comprehensive look, but rather a short summary of some of the issues that we've been able to report over the past few months. Lack of access to soap, no face mask distribution, no replacements given to when those masks break, no proper sanitation or materials to clean their cells, no testing of asymptomatic individuals, vastly reduced programmatic hours, unnecessary shuffling of individuals across cells and pods, and lack of testing before releasing individuals to the community. I'll close out my comments by sharing the quick story of Mr. Nelson Sims, 
who was incarcerated in January of 2020 and served eight months inside the Coy's Bird Detention Center in Riverside County. Mr. Sims was constantly denied his medications for close to a month, which resulted in him having a stroke in early March. This entire incident and this entire scare for him and his family could have been completely avoided if deputies had just adhered to and listened to his request for medication. But it's not just Mr. Sims that's unsafe in these county jails. So are the deputies. Just two weeks ago, Cal OSHA fined Riverside County Sheriff's Department for over $20,000 uh, $20, uh, for failure to, to meet the COVID-19 protection guidelines and guidance set for correctional facilities. So if deputies aren't protected and safe, do you really think that incarcerated individuals are? Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, we have Miguel Garcia up next. After Miguel, we have Jane Dorotic. Um, Miguel? Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. My name is Miguel Garcia. I am I'm the advocacy coordinator with the anti recidivism Coalition. I have personal experience being formerly incarcerated as a youth and then along with my transition from DJJ to Riverside County Jail. However, I now currently work in Sacramento. I believe that for quite some time, a lot of these sheriffs have been un, un, not, have not been held accountable um, for sp speaking in point, the Sacramento County Sheriff who has not provided the data that was required by all sheriffs. And as a result, not, has been secretive of what has been going on within his department. I believe that the BSGC should uh, highlight the need to do unannounced, uh, unannounced inspections at it will hold these sheriffs accountable and let them know that their behavior should not just be checked right once a year, but throughout the whole entire year that they are taking care of young, young people and people within their care. We hear time and time about loved ones inside facilities who exper experience different types of behaviors. The need for cleanliness is sometimes given with a bottle of water to spray down in, in clean things. At times, there are food that goes cold before it is um, eaten, uh, and a lot of these things go unheard of. I, I feel that the BSCC should make sure that there are s some penalties when these individuals are not following the rules. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, we have Jane Dorotic up next, and after Jane, we have Mary Lou Alejandrez. Uh, Jane? Hi, my name is Jane Dorotic. I'm representing the California Coalition of Women Prisoners. I um, have lived experience having been recently incarcerated, and thanks to the wonderful work of the Loyola Project for the Innocent, I'm now exonerated. Um, I would just like to say that it's impossible in any jail prison detention facility to practice social distancing. You've heard before uh, the lack of adherence to PPEs, to um, regular testing is just not happening. Unannounced visits are really the only way to ensure better compliance. Having been a consultant myself in, with healthcare facilities, I know clearly how facilities will adhere and try and prepare for an announced visit. But if you had more unannounced visits, you would get the real picture. Um, I just wanna say that, that it's impossible to relieve some of the issues that have been stated before me without release. And this is a national crisis, COVID-19, the only answer is release. I know you don't have the authority to do that, but I just wanted to throw that in, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, we have Mary Lou Alejandrez um, up. And then after Mary Lou, we have Nate Williams. Uh, Mary Lou. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you who are fighting for our relatives behind the walls and in jails and in juvenile halls. Uh, I wanted to ask, well, one thing in Santa Cruz, I'm in Santa Cruz, Varios um, Unidos. And in Santa Cruz, we had uh, 10 staff members who went out on their own and had a gathering uh, 
all tested positive, came back to the jail and every, all, all the staff were tested positive, came back to the jail and didn't let them know. They, they came back to work uh, knowing that they had exposed themselves and exposed all the inmates in our county jail. Uh, right now, they tested the inmates. Uh, they tested negative according to what they're telling us. But I don't understand how so many 10 staff members could come in testing positive with over 300 inmates. And they're telling us that nobody tested positive. It's, it, it really angers me. We deal with the families that have been coming to Barrios y Nidos asking for help. What can we do? And one of the biggest things concerns me is that um, if the BSCC uh, doesn't, doesn't um, do surprise visits and uh, announces yourself when you're coming in, it just allows them time to clean up their mess. And these families and, and, and people behind the bars are suffering because of individuals who are careless and and, and just don't care. And so I would really, really like to see that if you ever come to Santa Cruz County Jail, that you contact Santa Cruz Barrios Unidos and allow us to be part of your inspection. Although the jail, um, long story short, the jail has taken my clearance away um, for a really stupid thing that happened years ago and not at, not at my fault at all, that this is what the jail does. They, the Santa Cruz County Jail chooses who they want to let in and not let in according to how they feel that day. But my concern right now is the family, the members that are in county jail, not receiving proper care, not receiving PPE, not getting soaps, not getting anything. This We hear this, we get calls from them. We hear this from the families. The families come to our office, you know, in tears because they, they're they just scared. And again, we need to hold our jail accountable. And I know that Andrew uh, Mills is, is part of your um, board member. He is our chief of police. And I know he doesn't have any contact, I mean, any authority over the sheriffs, but Andy, you know us. You know, Nana, you know all of us, and we are asking, we're pleading with you to help us deal with the situation in the Santa Cruz County Jail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, up next, we have Nate Williams, and after Nate, I have Cynthia Long. Nate? All right, Nate Williams, Executive Director of Choices for Freedom. Um, I work with a lot of individual organizations on this call, but I wanna say this that this reminds me, like I'm system impacted. I've been in the system my whole life. This reminds me of prison. Like when stuff goes on in prison and they want to um, look into guards and catch people or whatever in their actual time, it's the inspector general that comes through. It's the same way. It's, it's like they know they're coming before they get there. So they're not going to be the same way when you get there. So with the surprise business, it's like when you go in your room to look at your kid, you don't go um, you don't go and tell the kid you come. You go when the kid, when you think the kid is doing something bad. That's how you have to be. We all on this call, most of us system impacted, know what it takes to go catch people in there because we lived it. There's stuff that goes on that's not even said. Like, um, like I'm doing ride homes now. So what I do is I pick everybody up from the county jails, from prisons. When I go to the county jails, there's no, there's, the guards even work outside when you come in through the entrance to pick them up. It's like rude. Um, half of them don't wear masks. Um, it's dirty. I don't even be want to go in there. Um, but if they knew you was coming, guess what? It'd be clean, right? That's wrong. I have I have actual footage, cameras, because when I pick people up, I give them gift cards. I give them masks. I give them everything that they're not getting inside there. And... I film everything. So if you want to see some of this footage of these guys, I, I haven't been in there in over 40 years, but if you want to hear the testimonies of the guys that I pick up, as well as women, I pick up women and men, I, I'm, I'm happy to share those with you. And they can speak for themselves on some horrible things that you haven't heard on this call. I'm talking about things that even scared me. And I was in county jails and prisons before Never heard of stuff that's going on now. And I'm going to keep this short because I know y'all working with time. 
and I'm traveling. Thank you. My name is Nate Williams, Choice for Freedom. Thank you, Nate. Um, up next, I have Cynthia Longs, and after Cynthia, I have George Villa. Cynthia? Hello, my name is Cynthia Longs, and I am a software test engineer, but I work with um, Debug because my son is um, incarcerated in downtown uh, San Jose. I'm in Santa Clara County. I visited my son uh, within the last three weeks. We visited my grandson, as I have visited um, one, you know, once a week for three weeks, and um, what is happening is that once we enter the, uh, the facility, they take our temperature and then there's um, gloves, hand sanitizer, and the, um, and the other thing, the, the paper's there. Sometimes the paper's not there. That's a problem. Somebody's not doing their job to keep that place, uh, to keep that supplies on board. Also, uh, we sit and wait, but when we're waiting there, the seats have been separated, whereby they are six feet apart. Uh, once we're called to go up, that is a major problem. We're having masks, of course, once we in, we're in, but they try to put all of us in the elevator. I myself have um, a new kidney. It's, it's older now, but um, I first insisted on making sure that I not go up with the other visitors and they were okay with it. Some of the guards are good about it and some are not good about it. But the interesting thing is um, once we're up, there and you get off the elevator, it is filthy. It is dirtier than I've ever seen it before, even before COVID. It has not been mopped. And uh, what, we, what we also see is you, you're up in the elevator, there's a little lobby area and there's eight doors. And one of those rooms have been designated as a sanitizer area. So we, the visitors have to wash our doorknobs. We have to also, uh, we use the gloves, of course, we have to go in and once we go into the counters, the counters are filthy. I mean, and the floors have not been mopped. And I've looked even on my son's side and it's just as bad. So the glass that divides us also is very filthy. And I've talked to him about masks and he's able to get a mask, but the mask he gets, he says that it doesn't last long. And when he tries to get another one, it takes them forever to get back to him. So uh, that is the problem here in Santa Clara County. I don't understand how and why it's not being cleaned. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand that. The whole area, even on his side is very nasty. So. He can't clean that area over there, but we're able to clean our area. And all I mean by cleaning is just putting spray on the paper towel and doing what we do once we have um, our, uh, uh, with, with our gloves on. So uh, that is a big problem. Um, I don't feel safe visiting my son and I don't feel that he's safe inside. So I'm really concerned about the, um, about that situation and why it's not being um, cleaned properly and why, uh, why are, you know, we pay our tax dollars. I don't understand why it's gotten worse because of COVID, the filthiness. And also the area, once we, we're upstairs uh, visiting, sometimes it's very cold, sometimes it's very hot. Maybe there's no, no um, way to control the temperature or what have you, but I'm told that COVID is worse and what, a cold environment, but it's been cold many a day. So I don't know if that's, um, something that's breeding it worse or what have you, but uh, I didn't have it written out and sorry, I, uh, hopefully I got to cover everything. But the main thing is even they treat, so if they treat us this bad, the visitors, can you imagine how the inmates are treated? The people inside, uh, a lot of them are inside as my son, they're waiting for court. It, uh, we've been waiting for court for nine months because of COVID. And so to say, to make a long story short, we're innocent until proven guilty. We haven't even got to that point and we have been subject to such inhumane conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And um, we have resolved the issues with the chat feature. I apologize for any, um, any issues with that, but it looks like it's up and running again. Thank you for your patience. Um, George Via, and after George, I have Vanya Quarles. Uh, George. Thank you. Um, good evening, members of the BSCC, local stakeholders and community members. Uh, my name is George Via. I'm the research associate for Restoring Promise team um, for motivating individual leadership for public advancement. That's Milpa out of Salinas. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently also a grad student for the community development group at UC Davis. Um, and I also spend time at the Juvenile Hall in Salinas and the Department of Juvenile Justice, the old CYA. I'm one of the first in the state to return back and provide healing and trauma informed indigenous-based um, teachings and rites of passage to our young men that are in there. 
And I was going in there um, before COVID for about two years, and I never had any problems with the youth that were there. Um, it actually made my job a lot, a lot easier. And um, we had a lot of, a lot of great experiences together. Um, and one of the things that I'm really concerned about right now is this, this outbreak of COVID that, um, that we're, we heard about, but we're not really, um, you know, we don't really know what's happening there. I've had a few parents call me um, and they're very stressed out. Um, and another thing, um, as Jane mentioned earlier, like having the, the PPEs, mask, hand sanitizers, um, just two weeks ago, I was on a Zoom call with, with, the, with the seven youth um, on American Hall and none of them were wearing masks, you know? Um, and so that's a problem that we need to handle. Um, another thing um, is the reintegration process back into society. You know, there's uh, hundreds, if not thousands of barriers that we face every day coming, coming home to, uh, to society. Um, another concern that I have um, is, is, you know, when I was there, um, two of my youth that were in my groups, um, the staff called them the B word on two different occasions, and they ended up assaulting them on both Cajun, so I, I would like for the staff to have more, have more respect, have more, more care, you know, it's, you have a job to do so. And lastly, I, I also would like to um, ask that the staff, you know, um, I've written several letters of support for youth that are coming back home. And I, I you know, follow up with an email would be nice. So if, if I can ask of y'all to um, encourage them to respond back to emails, that'd be great. Um, and besides that, you know, thank you all for, for your, do, for your amazing work. And, um, thank you for everything that y'all are doing. Thank you. You're on mute. Hello. That is the catchphrase for 2020. I apologize. It was bound to happen at least once during this meeting. Uh, thank you, George. Um, after, uh, sorry, Oof, get my head back on. Um, I have Vanya Quarles up next. And after Vanya, I have Lenora Taylor. We are picking up the raised hands. We just lower your hand after we've added you to the queue. So um, Vanya and then L Lenora, thank you. Thank you, Allison. My name is Vonia and I work for Starting Over. And we provide transitional housing and reentry services as direct services, but we also um, do a lot of community organizing and civic engagement work. And so our ear has been uh, close to families who've been impacted, not just with incarceration normally, but incarceration during the period of this pandemic. It's been extremely difficult we are hearing reports about uh, some of the jails out here in the inland region, not even providing hot meals, uh, that they're eating sandwiches more, more often. Um, as an attorney, um, I get to go inside the jails even during the pandemic. And what I've seen are the same things that Mrs. Longs and other people on this call have expressed. And that is there is a clear uh, need for cleanliness and I've gone into uh, the sheriff's stations, uh, into the jails to take clothing in for clients. And um, the sheriffs are not wearing face masks appropriately, oftentimes wearing them below the uh, nose or under the chin if they're wearing them. And I've gone to visitation rooms on a Tuesday uh, and seeing like big trash cans that are full sitting in the uh, attorney visiting room or next to it. And then I go back four days later and it's still sitting there. Um, so it's pretty clear that the sanitation isn't happening. And what we're asking for is that the BSCC come to the jails in our region and actually um, come without notifying the sheriffs that you're coming so that you can see what we're living with. Um, back in April, the four fatalities that Alan Edwards shared about were reported. However, since that time, there have been no reports other than the reports that we get from family members who have shared about their loved ones coming into contact with other people, being handcuffed to other people um, who actually have COVID and, the, and they haven't. And so those are, those are things very concerning. 
um, what makes it really difficult, I think, for family members at this time is the fact that they cannot go and see their loved one in person. And so we think that it's easier to not do the visitation, um, but we think that it's much better to have responsible visitation even during this COVID pandemic and probably even more importantly, because of this COVID pandemic, that visitation of family members be allowed to resume. People are being locked up for 23 hours a day. There is heightened uh, security watches, suicide watches going on because nine months is too long. Children uh, need to see their parents, whether they're incarcerated or not, they're still their parents. And we think that's important enough reason right there for visitation, family visitation to resume. We also think that if you're gonna prioritize what's most important, that family should come before attorney visits. And if I can go inside and visit someone's son or daughter, the family should be able to do the same. The, the COVID doesn't know the difference, doesn't make a distinction between attorneys and family members. And we don't think the sheriff should either. Um, we also think that isolations of people 23 hours a day or more is too much. We've noted the lack of sanitation. We've gotten reports from people that they do not have appropriate masks. They receive two masks, the paper kind that we see, and they have to use that for a whole week. There's no way possible that that can be sanitary. We have not decreased the population in the Riverside jails to the point that they can actually safely distance themselves as ordered by state mandates. And so we think that's also problematic. Our sheriff believes that if a person has decided to come to jail, that they have to live or die with the consequences during this pandemic, and he is not going to try and do releases. We want you to go inside and see for yourself if our sheriff is adhering to the laws and the policies prescribed or he isn't. So thank you very much for you all having, having this listening session and we look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Vonya. Um, I have Lenora Taylor up next. And after Lenora, I have Jennifer Rodriguez. Uh, Lenora? Good evening, everybody. My name is Lenora Taylor. I have two family members that is incarceration. One's my son-in-law, he's in Southwest. And I know for a fact that the conditions when you walk into the lobby, the lobby's dirty. Then you walk down the hall to where you go to the visit. They got pipes leaking down where it's like puddles of water. It looks like blood. And it's just disgusting. One another thing, they're not feeding them decent meals. Sandwiches locked in 23 hours a day. Uh, we pay for, when you pay for a phone card, it also says you can video, but we yet have, I want to know why come we can't have video uh, visits because you can pay for it. They take our money for it. When you pay for a phone call card, you pay it also for video, but you get, you don't get video. I got another, uh, Godson and Banning. They're not giving them masks. They're giving them sandwiches. He think he's got the virus. I've had one son release, but they didn't send his medication. When they didn't send his medication, he wound up in a semi coma in him in the hospital. This is the kind of uh, way they do our families. They don't care about them, they no consideration whatsoever. They may get their medication, they may not. Have one friend of mine's son had just got in there and he was supposed to have his, uh, his medicine at seven o'clock in the morning. They wouldn't give it to him. They finally gave it to him late that evening. You know, it's kind of stuff like that is inhumane. Those are human beings. Not animals. Animals, like I said in a speech, animals get treated better at the zoo than 
our inmates, our family members do. So I want to plead to anybody, hey, let's get this together. Let's fight for our family. It is time for us to fight for our family. Thank you. Thank you, Lenora. Um, I have Jennifer Rodriguez up next. After Jennifer, I have James Martinez. Uh, Jennifer? Um, hi, um, I have a loved one that's incarcerated at San Mateo County Jail. Um, he was transferred here from CDCR in the end of February. Um, when he was brought back to court to the county, he was not tested. Um, he was not quarantined. Um, since he's been there, he's just had so many problems with um, the officers there. Um, he's now have been in uh, solitary confinement for the past six months, I believe, um, for no reason. They don't give him like a specific answer as to why he's being held in segregation. Um, he's only allowed to come out for 23 hour, uh, for 30 minutes um, a day to use the phone or to shower. Um, it's so dirty in there. He doesn't have any masks. I mean, he has one mask that they gave him back in July. Um, th they don't get very much soap. We're not allowed to buy them soap. Um, there's no soap on the commissary list and there's no soap for me to buy him through the packages. Um, it's just, it's just very dirty inside. And he tells me that there's, um, people in there that have mental health issues that throw feces and urinate all over where the uh, phones are being used. Um, there's no sanitation to clean the phones. And also we haven't been able to have any um, non-contact visits since March. Um, the sheriff won't respond back to emails why he won't give us our visits. If attorneys can come in safely, why can't the families? Um, and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that you guys know that this is really happening in our counties and, and these people really need help and COVID is inside the jails and they're not being, they're not being helped. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I have James Martinez. And then after James, I have uh, Jamie from Homies Unidos uh, organization. Uh, James? Good evening, BSCC board. Thank you for opening up this space today for a public comment session regarding enhanced inspections process. My name is James Martinez. I'm a policy and programs assistant with Milpa based out of Salinas, California and a Sacramento State University student pursuing my major in philosophy and ethics and law. Being formally system impacted, I am aware of the inhumane jail conditions and unconstitutional treatment against the house and lockup facilities that continue to persist. Today, I'm here to encourage BSCC to acknowledge and adhere to the request of the community stakeholders who are invested in improving the conditions within detention facilities. I wanna thank community members for showing up for our system impacted community that is vulnerable and defenseless. Remember, we are their voice. Thank you for your time. Thank you, James. Um, I have Jamie and then I have uh, Mizzy Garcia. Uh, Jamie? Uh, thank you, BSCC. Uh, the reason I'm gonna touch what I ta I'm gonna touch is uh, the undocumented that are detained uh, Adelanto. I know this is our funny yells and juveniles. Uh, but uh, since uh, detainees, detainees uh, Adelanto, ICE Department, you know, uh, have no voice, I have to bring this up, you know, and, and I'm wondering if maybe you guys uh, might know uh, something that can be done about those people, you know. Uh, uh, my organization deals in different, with different uh, people, with people are the private delivery, CDC and uh, state. Uh, federal or, you know, an ICE department. And uh, we have received numerous calls where uh, they say uh, a unit that have four houses, 47 people, uh, 45 people, 37 of them have come out positive with a uh, virus. You know, people being thrown uh, with knowingly uh, officers or being thrown people that are, are known to have the virus with people that are not, uh, that are not that are negative. 
So, you know, uh, they can, they don't care, you know, uh, they, for them, they treat them like uh, inhuman. Uh, so, you know, it's a major concern, you know, families out here uh, uh, are the ones raising their voices, you know, trying to get help. And, uh, you know, it, it's a major concern, you know, I know uh, the families, uh, the ma majority of them, are a Spanish speaking community. And a lot of them, they, they live with they're citizens of the United States. But it just happens that the, the loved ones got into uh, travel or, 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 you know, they were detained for whatever in the past for entering the country legally. So, but the thing is that they need a voice. You know, and I believe, like I say, I know this is uh, the juveniles, uh, the county jails, and all this, but it's still. These are people that need a voice and hopefully uh, maybe somehow one of you uh, might know someone or might know something that can be done about them. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I have uh, Mizzy Garcia and after Mizzy, I have uh, uh, Andrea St. Julian, uh, Mizzy. Thank you very much, um, board members of the BSCC. My name is Andrea Garcia Ponte de Leon, and I'm with San Bernardino Freedom All and Riverside All of Us Union and Transforming Justice Orange County. And some of the things that I'd like to share with you have, have uh, already been said, and it's very unfortunate that we constantly hear these things and yet we don't see any actions or we don't see corrections. Uh, one of our main concerns is the unsanitary conditions in which people are in facilities within San Bernardino County jails. Now, we have heard so many horrible things during this crisis and throughout the pandemic. It's unimaginable that folks are expected to, to socially distance when that's not, not feasible. And yet, folks do not have access to cleaning um, cleaning agents. Folks do not have access to bleach. Folks do not have hand sanitizer. The things that we are asked to do and to take precautions here on the outside, what about the folks on the inside? They have access to none of that. Folks until recently didn't have adequate access to soap. Uh, there was not soap in commissary for folks to purchase unless it was through a package. The package roughly costs about $30, $30 plus a, about a $7 fee for, for men and women's is about $37 plus $7 fee in order to receive a hygiene package. Outside of that, what, what would folks use to try to keep um, or maintain some type of cleanliness and sanitary conditions? It's expected that that people are cleaning up after themselves, but there really is no deep, thorough cleaning and, and sanitization happening inside the jails. Um, it's a person or designated person that is given a mop and some water, possibly a cleaning agent, but th that can't leave from there. It's poured into the buckets already for them. And they're told, okay, you now here clean with this dirty, dirty mop and you know, do whatever you want to do. Some people clean in, in a hurry. It's not very thorough. It's just like someone has to do it. Somebody better do it or else if not, then you're not, you're going to have things taken away from you, which are phone time, which may be time out um, when you're programming and maybe going to yard. And right now, d presently during this new wave and, and lockdown, People are, are locked up 23 and a half hours a day and only allowed to program for 30 minutes, that, which includes a possible 20 minute phone call and 10 minutes to maybe shower or to do something else, maybe check, check on your commissary or, or place an order. Outside of that, um, we are very, very concerned that there isn't testing happening for folks that are asking to be tested. We have numerous complaints of people that have been asking over the course of many months to become tested because they have either been quarantined or they have been around people that were positive and they will not, they will not be tested. They have put in grievances. We are really um, 
at the end of our ropes here because we we feel like this just isn't people people are not respected enough that are incarcerated and their health should very much be respected because this is a part of the problem and also a part of the solution. Going forward, we would like to see that there is some kind of a written standard and guidelines for inspections uh, as well as unannounced inspections. And we would like to see, um, or our recommendation would be to have a, a safety protocol as well as a um, inspections team to include subject matter matter experts and community members, especially highlighting the voices of impacted and formerly incarcerated people. They can talk about these situations that have de definitely been there or they have direct knowledge of what is happening currently. Also, um, there has been a lack, a lack of disregard to to people that are incarcerated. We recently were contacted regarding a situation that happened with, with two people that were in a cell and a staff member decided asked them to place their hands on their their door. He then he then placed his taser on the door and tased them through the door for no reason, which is absolutely uncalled for and also a direct violation of their civil rights. There's so many things like this that are happening and yet we don't see enough action. And we really do uh, thank you for having us here today and holding this space, although this is something that has been ongoing and we wish to, to see some type of relief in the very near future. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everybody, um, I know some people have joined in um, since the beginning. If um, individuals would like to um, provide public comment, please put your name in the chat and we will add you to the queue. Um, if you're on the phone, um, you can dial star nine to, to virtually raise your hand or you can go ahead and raise your hand and we'll put you in the queue. Um, we are asking that, um, um, that comments be um, kept to around two minutes, um, if people could be mindful of that. And we have um, Andrea St. Julian next. And then after uh, Andrea, we have Renee Menard. Um, Andrea? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Allison. I am co-chair of San Diegans for Justice. I'm also an attorney uh, who primarily represents indigent clients. Consequently, uh, most of my clients are incarcerated in some form or fashion. And, and you know, I, we've heard a lot from people uh, about uh, deplorable conditions and other things like that. But I, I want to talk a little more basically, because I think the real problem is a lack of will to actually address these problems. These problems are so rampant, so rampant, but we see none of them being addressed, right? Um, when I have to talk to um, prison officials about an issue, it is very clear that they, they can act with complete and total uh, uh, impunity, right? They are not, I can complain to the cows come home and they can basically laugh at me and thumb their noses because nothing's going to be done about what they've done. And they know it because what's going to happen? What's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen is that a prisoner actually complains. And what is gonna happen with that complaint, right? What's gonna happen is, oh, we have a staff saying he didn't do something. And then we have a, uh, um, an inmate, a person who is committed a crime who says something the opposite. Who are we gonna believe? we always default to believing the staff member, okay? And until we change that dynamic, none of this is going to change, right? You, you know, I'm an attorney. I Process is important to me, right? But in this context, process is used as an excuse for addressing the problems. Oh, well, we went and we inspected. Oh, we went in and we allow them to make complaints. We took, we took their complaints. We even did an investigation on their complaints, right? And then that process is used an excuse because, oh, we did all that and everything is just fine. Oh yeah, everything is just fine, right? That is the problem. 
And what I think I and everyone else on this call is essentially saying is there is no will to in fact change what is happening. And we are going through a series of charades to pretend like we are doing something that is actually going to change what is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, next up, I have Renee Menart. And after Renee, I have Daisy Ramirez. Uh, Renee? Good evening. Renee Menart with the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice in San Francisco. The Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice, CJCJ, is a community-based organization that provides direct services for justice-involved youth and adults, many of which have experienced detention in San Francisco's jail and juvenile hall. And we also provide policy analysis and technical assistance. I thank the, the BSCC staff for holding this community listening session. And as you can see today, members of the public care deeply for our neighbors, friends, children, and family members that are currently experiencing detention under the BSCC's watch. I ask that the BSCC seriously consider the concerns raised today to correct its mistakes and rebuild public trust. As a starting point, I appreciate that the BSCC will review public comments at its next board meeting and hope the agency will commit to taking action for the protection of people inside local facilities. In addition to all that's been raised tonight, I'd like to uplift a few key recommendations. First, I echo the request that the BSCC move to conduct unannounced inspections of local facilities. The BSEC needs to do so in order to allow inspectors to see the jails and juvenile facilities as they routinely function, not just how they look or function after days or weeks of preparation, often to the detriment of people who are incarcerated. Secondly, I ask that the BSEC establish a written protocol for interviewing detained individuals. I understand that the BSEC has wide variation in its inspections. Uh, reports with respect to who has been interviewed, how those individuals have been interviewed, and what the context was for attaining those, those responses from incarcerated individuals. I'm very concerned that the BSEC engages with detained individuals through impromptu interactions, often in common areas, with limited, which limits information that can be made available and risks the individual's safety. This is often out of legitimate fear of retaliation that incarcerated individuals may not be able to fully express their experiences. Um, and that is something that we've seen through studies such as one through the University of Michigan Journal of Law Reform that found that 70% of incarcerated respondents who, found, who brought grievances forward indicated that they had suffered retaliation thereafter. The BSEC needs to establish a written protocol to ensure that the safety of individuals is placed at the center of interviews. And the inspector should be directed to set a minimum standard, uh, sorry, a minimum number of interviews of people who are detained inside the facilities, which represent different population demographics. Lastly, I ask that the BSEC inspections focus on implementation of regulations as, and also that the reports note broader observations about facility conditions. The inspections report reports suggest that the facility is considered in compliance simply if it has a written policy, but it doesn't take a it, it, it doesn't fully describe whether that policy is actually implemented. And we need more information on the implementation of the policies, not only the a review of the what's on paper. As you can hear today, that is simply not what's happening inside facilities, regardless of what exists on paper. The BSCC should also track and include in its reports issues that the, the BSCC should also include in its reports um, issues that may fall outside of the scope of title regulations. While we understand that is the focus for determining non-compliance, the BSCC is observing what's happening in the facilities and your staff are one of the few to do so. Without the BSCC noting um, these issues in their reporting, issues that pertain to the health and well-being of people inside of local facilities, members of the public have only become aware of grave conditions through media reporting. The BSCC is tasked with inspecting and reporting on facility conditions, not journalists, and we need you to hold counties accountable for their actions. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, we have Daisy Ramirez next. And after Daisy, we have Kent Mendoza. Daisy? 
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Daisy Ramirez and I'm from the ACLU of Southern California and Transforming Justice Orange County. As a jails conditions and policy coordinator at ACLU SoCal, I examine conditions of confinement in Orange County jails and advocate on behalf of people in custody. Our team receives requests for assistance and complaints about conditions in OC jails in writing and via our incarcerated people's hotline. Incarcerated people consistently report violent, abusive, and unhealthy conditions in Orange County jails, including one, an inadequate and failed response to COVID-19. People behind bars are terrified that they will get COVID-19 and never make it out. Many people have reported custody staff not wearing masks, the inability to social distance, lack of access to hygiene and cleaning supplies, and denial of hot meals for months on end. Two, deaths in custody. As of September 2020, 12 people have died in the custody of the Orange County Sheriff's Department. More people have died in OCSD custody this year than in any of the last four years. In 2018, the Orange County Grand Jury found that 44% of deaths in the jails from 2014 to 2017 could have been prevented by timely and adequate medical care. Three, delays in medical and mental health treatment or flat out denials are a common problem in OC jails. This year, the grand jury found multiple deficiencies in processes and practices for identifying and providing medical care to persons who may be pregnant. The report includes horrifying details of an incarcerated person giving birth. The person was kept shackled by a deputy at a hospital, despite doctors asking that they be removed because the incarcerated person was cooperative and immobilized by an epidural. The report also includes details of access to menstrual products being restricted or denied entirely. An incarcerated person who experienced contractions, stomach cramps, and vaginal bleeding and gave birth to a 25-week stillborn fetus while sitting on the toilet in her cell. After the delivery, the incarcerated person who had to ration her pads because, she, because the staff did not provide her with enough to address the bleeding. Four, indiscriminate shackling of people in jail custody. In 2019, the Sheriff's Department began to shackle every single person during transport to and from court and while in court holding tanks with no consideration for their mental or physical conditions. We have learned from incarcerated people about the painful and degrading experience of being shackled for up to 12 to, four, for up to, 12 to 15 hours on court dates. People have described the practice as cruel and report they have difficulty engaging in basic human needs, such as eating and using the bathroom. Five, excessive use of force and de deputy failure to intervene and protect incarcerated people from violence. Six, the use of solitary confinement as punishment. Seven, lack of access to and denial of grievance forms. Eight, unfair disciplinary process where involved staff are present during disciplinary hearings and incarcerated people are not allowed to call witnesses. The list goes on and on. That this is happening in Orange County jails and other jails throughout the state is morally corrupt and reprehensible. The Board of State and Community Corrections is in a position to ensure facilities are complying with Title 15 and 24 regulations. However, the BSEC has refused to use its political power for the protection of people incarcerated. Instead, it quietly collaborates with law enforcement officials. We know that this approach does not work. The enhanced inspections process falls significantly short of what is of what incarcerated folks actually need. Many of the changes are superficial. It still remains unclear what will happen if a county does not address compliance issues after appearing before the BSEC board. Title 15 and 24 minimum standards are useless if there is no mechanism for enforcement, scaled pressure, and accountability. The BSEC must take a stronger stance on issues of county noncompliance and needs to conduct unannounced inspections of local jail facilities. Scheduling inspections with facility administrators undermines the BSEC's ability to properly inspect jails and examine noncompliance issues. Incarcerated people in Orange County jails have regularly reported that custody staff alert them about inspections, demand that they clean and prepare for inspection visits, and direct them not to talk to anyone inspecting the facility. The BSEC must conduct unannounced inspections, allowing inspectors to see the jail as it normally functions. The BSEC should also expand its team to include community members and advocates. Inclusion of community members will improve the board's oversight capabilities by prioritizing the voices of directly impacted people. The BSEC must I also- for interrupting, we're, we're a little over two minutes, so if you could wrap up your comments. Please. Definitely. Um, 
I just want to wrap up by urging you to implement the recommendations that have been shared today and center the leadership and experiences of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, as well as that of their loved ones. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Daisy. Um, I have Kent Mendoza next. And after Kent, I have Hila uh, Gampan. Uh, Kent? Hi, uh, good, good evening, uh, board, uh, BSCC commissioners, committee members. Um, my name is Kent Mendoza. I am the advocacy manager here at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in LA County. Uh, I just wanted to speak on behalf of the currently uh, incarcerated individuals sitting in our county jails, in our local county jails. Um, I don't know if you are aware, but um, you know, the board in LA County has already tried to do many things to uh, hold our LA County Sheriff uh, accountable uh, you know, there's been a lot of troubling incidents in jail violence and, you know, and a lot of things that have happened in this county that have led to, you know, leadership over here to take actions starting in 2012 by creating the civilian oversight. And then in 2014 by implement, the board implementing new tools to enhance oversight, such as body warm cameras. Then in 2019, giving to peanut power to the civilian oversight commission. Um, and then, you know, all of this because of the things that, you know, concerns that have been happening in this, you know, in this jail and with the sheriff and everything around that. Uh, uh, the board also even here try to, you know, align the sheriff with the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, and I'm just saying all these things, you know, just to, uh, you know, because I know that today we're discussing that uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, enhance in inspection processes, you know, and we, you know, as a concerned person that was actually incarcerated personally for five years in juvenile systems and even in the county jail here and then DJJ and back in the county jail, uh, I, you know, I'm concerned that, uh, you know, after we here are trying to do everything we can to, you know, figure out how we can ensure that our members inside our loved ones, you know, even ARC members who we serve are coming out of these facilities, you know, traumatized, you know, and 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 especially now with COVID-19, we don't know how exactly this is being handled. So I'm just urging this board to really try to do something ab about this, you know. And I know you got y'all, y'all don't have much power in terms of uh, in some in some ways, you know, but what you can do is, you know, really try to go into these facilities, inspect them and really provide real analysis of them to the public uh, and even provide public statements about the concerns about these facilities and these places, uh, just to ensure that if we are gonna have these types of settings to exist in a society where I believe we shouldn't have these types of settings, where we believe we shouldn't have these settings, that at least there is real uh, checks and balances and oversights. and. It seems like we have tried everything over here and I'm coming to you all, to this board, uh, finding for help and solutions and you you can do something about it and uh, uh, such as analyzing, inspecting it unannounced and providing some type of recommendations or statements about the bad things about this facility. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, yeah. So yeah, I guess I, and I'm speaking on behalf of all of the people who are formerly incarcerated, the people that we represent and just people who are being uh, not being held because there's no real true uh, oversight about this jails and facilities. So thank you so much and uh, have a great night. Thank you, Kent. Um, as we um, get closer and closer um, to the, the end of our evening, I want to remind people that if you'd like to provide written comment, um, please email us at regulations at bscc.ca.gov. And also if someone's watching this recording um, after uh, December 9th, feel free to please um, um, submit comments to that email box as well. So I have Hyla Gantan up next. After that, I have Leah Volk. Um, Hyla. Good evening and thank you for allowing for public comment this evening. And thank you everyone for continuing the work for our community. My name is Hyla Ganton from the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Tonight, I address the concern of inadequate nutrition within the correctional system. I personally am a formerly incarcerated woman who has experienced the conditions within Sacramento County Jails. I recall my first experiences within the correctional rations 
A correctional officer drops a tray on the ground, which was slop of different degrees of brown and texture. Even the mysterious vegetable had lost its color to mush. The food on the ground in its service and its appearance was subhuman above all else. Fed and housed in the same manner as of an animal is cruel and unusual punishment. Food portions and nutritional content were not nutritious by any means. Each meal was overloaded with starchy foods, many of which were doubling as a source of carbohydrate and a protein. Bread, beans, and rice were a common meal, never quite satiating our hunger. Last night's dinner was blended into an unrecognizable liquid, mockingly referred to as soup that was served for lunch in eight out cups, in eight out cups with bread. I strongly urge that a random sample of dead man trees be collected and analyzed for the following. Macronutrient content, portion size, food safety in its freshness and food quality. I recommend that this be a blind unannounced inspection done over the course of a six week period or at least throughout the entire cycle of the institution's rotational menu. I request that the menus and rations be compliant with the national standards that are published in the HHS and USDA's Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015 through 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Hyla. I have a, I have a uh, repeating going on. Um, I have Leah Volk, and after that, I have Pat Davis. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for giving me this space to speak. I am incredibly grateful to all of you that are here to provide public comment and to hear our perspectives and suggestions for bettering the system. Um, I apologize for not having something, you know, formally written up, so this might be a little um, distracted, but the numbers plainly speak for themselves. And unfortunately, you know, those numbers of rampant outbreak in our jails and our facilities are shameful. Rather than seeing these numbers rise and rise, our facilities should actually be case studies for containment. Um, the state has all of the means at their hands and taxpayer money to provide proper PPE and especially to enforce the regulations at a state level. Um, we've also heard from parents with juveniles in the juvenile facilities that, you know, some of their children are getting sick and they aren't even getting notified. They're actually having um, issues and problems reaching authorities that can provide them information on their sick children, which is obviously unacceptable. Um, you know, the, the pandemic has magnified inequalities in our greater society and um, it is also magnifying the inequalities that already existed in our systems. Um, so is this just sheds light on the usual impunity that we see given to officer abuse and failures to comply with state regulations, um, which we even see previously with things like non -pot potable water um, being allowed for our inmates. And so I would like to suggest actual repercussions and punishment for first facilities that high that have high numbers of COVID outbreaks, deaths, um, and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Aliyah. I have Pat Davis next. And after Pat, I have Israel uh, Via. Um, Pat? Good evening. I, I wasn't sure if I was going to speak, but goodness, the expertise and the um, degree of experience in this room is uh, quite touching. And <clears throat> I worked in higher ed for many years and worked with folks who were in some kind of a pre-release program. And to hear going on now and my own work with the unhoused and women in the community, it, it's so painful. I mean, it feels like we're 30, 40 years ago. So my hopes are that this body who's called this gathering has some influence and if not, figure out ways to do so. I come from a perspective of having, I, I live in Orange County. Uh, Ms. Ramirez has spoken to the grand jury report and what was so heartbreaking to hear 
and frightening was the board and the sheriff's response to that grand jury report, during which time they deflected and denied just about every claim in the report. And we, we know that things happened and that's their typical way of responding. So again, if this body doesn't have influence and nobody's gonna check this group, uh, the system will never improve. I've also had an adult family member who some probably three years ago was in jail on a DUI, uh, an adult male, quite ill, uh, certainly in withdrawals, no meds for three days, put in situations where inmate to inmate violence was encouraged. About a month ago, I've been entrusted with the diary that was written during that time. And a gentleman who had been in jail at the same time was sentenced. And the trauma that returned to this individual who just saw a clip on TV about someone who he was put up against in the jail. And I, I know this still happens. So it's, it's painful to hear. I can't imagine what it's like right now with COVID because of all the limitations, the transparency is minimal. Accountability seems to not be a vocabulary uh, for any uh, law enforcement in our state. And right now in Orange County, there's moving forward on building what they call a music jail, which they are advertising is going to be a mental health facility. And that alone uh, should worry all of us. And especially for my unhoused and the women who are coming out. Um, and I do know a couple of the women who were mentioned in that report for lack of maternal care. So uh, whatever you can do and all of you in this room, thank you. Thank you. And let's hope something gets better. Thank you, Pat. Um, Israel uh, Villa, and then after Israel, I have Noemi Oseguera. Israel? Yes, uh, good evening, buenas noches, folks. My name is Israel Villa from Salinas, California, currently an honor to be the Deputy Director of the California Alliance for Youth and Community Justice. Uh, before I give my comment, I just wanna acknowledge and thank all of the uh, my formerly incarcerated peers, all the uh, system impacted families and advocates and lawyers who have uh, provided comment thus far. Man, this is painful, this is tough. Uh, I definitely support and endorse the, 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 the ask of unannounced inspections uh, with community inclusion, meaning community-based partners, community-based organizations, formerly incarcerated, system impacted uh, community leaders, uh, and then another idea, I think uh, even a better one where we can, uh, you know, get a righteous inspection uh, would be just a complete community process, some kind of community inspection, some kind of community oversight. Um, also, um, proper PPE and sanitation is a big, big concern in all of these conversations. I know that the BACC is primarily responsible for county, juvenile and adult facilities, but uh, we're concerned about the entire thing our kids in DJJ, our adult relatives within CDCR, our juvenile halls, our camps, ranches, the whole nine. Uh, unfortunately, we know that jails uh, are the hotspots, you know, it's worse. I know out here in the, in the communities, we're all getting shut down, but the, the, the numbers in CDC are ridiculous. I know we just had a, a, a outbreak, a second outbreak in DJJ, uh, the first being in the summer. And I know that uh, my, 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 uh, comrades and, and colleagues during the summer initial outbreak, we met with a bunch of people, a bunch of legislators, directors of DJJ's office of this and that, and we didn't get nowhere. Uh, we're, we're had, we just had a second outbreak last week. There's almost 40 kids tested positive right now, and we're very much concerned with their well-being, their safety, and their lives. These are our children. Uh, so again, we need to ensure that proper PPE and sanitation is being afforded, which we know it is not. And I'm sure we heard plenty of examples of it not being in all these different places. Uh, also, another huge recommendation and need is to cease uh, intake and transfers, right? I know DJJ, it has to do with DJJ and the counties. Uh, our, we don't want no counties sending our kids to DJJ where it's a hotspot, right? Uh, we don't want no kids being transferred facility to facility because it's dangerous, you're endangering their lives. Uh, again, DJJ has closed, this is the fourth time they closed intake. Why are you opening it if we have not solved the COVID crisis out here and especially not in there? Um, and the same applies to adults. Also, 
they shouldn't be arresting, uh, especially our children for petty offenses, technical pro violations, uh, misdemeanors, even nonviolent felonies. Um, and the same goes for the adult populations, jails and prison facilities, all of them, they're not made for social distancing. They're actually made to warehouses. Uh, so you can't social distance. So with that in mind, we need to expedite releases. We need to expedite releases of our kids and our adult relatives, those with underlying conditions, especially uh, those who are maybe six months, a year to the house, six months to the house, something, some form of expedited releases to shrink the overall populations within these facilities so that maybe then you can try, they can try to adhere to the COVID uh, protocols and, and policies. Um, another one real fast, uh, as far as uh, uncooperative sheriffs, you know, I know I heard in a recent BSEC meeting, a great suggestion, but actually by a BSEC member, if these sheriffs are not cooperating, providing the data that's needed in order to address the COVID concerns, then perhaps we need to figure out something to, so that these sheriffs cannot apply for the, for the funding, for the resources. At the end of the day, it's usually about money. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve on a steering committee or two, so I know about the grading process and the points and all that. Well, maybe they should be punished and penalized for not cooperating with your uh, recommendations. And uh, I think that's, that, that, that's, that's enough. And uh, thank you all for, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Israel. Um, I have Noemi Osaguera next, and then after uh, Noemi, I have Justin Parrish. Okay, hi. Well, thank you for your time tonight. Um, my name is Noemi Osaguera, and um, my brother is currently being held at McGuire um, Jail, and this is um, in San Mateo County. Um, sorry, my, um, my brother has been incarcerated incarcerated since September 2020. Since that date, uh, we've only seen his face in the courtroom. Uh, we've been unable to complete video visits due to continuous connection issues. We've attempted various laptops um, with or without wireless connection, Android phones, iPhones, desktops with no success. Um, he was a caregiver for my grandmother who suffers from Alzheimer's and she needs to see him in order to feel safe. My three-year-old son views my brother as a second father. His absence and inability to see him has affected my son emotionally and mentally as well. It breaks uh, my heart to hear that the most fragile members of our family are missing him and continuously ask for him. If behind the vis glass visits were reinstated, I think it will help my family a lot. Um, science has proven that humans need human connection and behind the glass visits offers somewhat of a human connection. Every week when my brother calls, he reminds me not to forget him. And I ask him, how can you think I would forget you? But he says, Mimi, once you stop seeing someone, it's easy to forget them. So please take a moment to hear that statement because it's very powerful and for many, very true. I won't forget him, but please help reinstate behind the glass visits. Give us back the ability to connect with our family members. We need to verify with our own eyes their safety. Uh, we have seen and we, I have personally witnessed and my sibling tells me about guards not wearing their simple face masks. I, wear, I work in the healthcare field and I have to wear N95 plus mask PPE gear 16 hours a day at times. So why are we not forcing these guards to do that? When you come to our facility, and you tell us that we're having an inspection, we're preparing for that inspection weeks ahead. And this is what I think is happening in the jails. And I think we all need to take some time to think that and be realistic with ourselves because that is exactly what is happening. And I think you guys need to show up unannounced just like you would if it was a CPS visit. You guys need to show up unannounced and see what the true story is behind not only from our words or Amy's words, but see it with your own eyes. And I think that's something very important and um, I appreciate your time. Happy holidays to you all, but please remember that these people that are inside, my brother, they're all human beings. And I myself wouldn't wanna be treated like that. So I don't think we should treat others like that. Thank you. Thank you, Noemi. Um, I have Heston Parrish and after Heston, I have Rhonda Swenson. Heston? Hello, my name is Heston Parrish and I'm a 15 year old legislative speaker representing Club Stride Incorporated. We have done our fair share of research and learned about the gross and unhealthy living conditions of the juvenile detention centers. 
As a club stride youth leader and leg legislative speaker, we believe that the conditions could be greatly remedied with these recommendations. Firstly, the BSCCC, the BSCC should not schedule visits, but instead should randomize their visits to ensure that the administrators in, of the juvenile detention centers are allowed following regulations and rehabilitating youth while ensuring the healthy living conditions. Secondly, those randomized visits should be frequent and the results should be made public in a timely manner. And thirdly, we recommend that the juvenile detainees be provided a confidential survey, allowing them a voice to disclose their living conditions. Lastly, it should be mandatory for guards to wear masks. According to my sources, some of the guards do not wear their masks, which could lead to the spread of COVID-19. In conclusion, by implementing our resolutions, Club Stride Incorporated believes that the quality and health uh, for our youth in these detention centers managed by the BSCC will be greatly increased. Thank you. Thank you, Heston. Um, I have Rhonda Swenson, and after Rhonda, I have David Duran. Hi, my name is Rhonda Swenson, and I've worked in criminal defense for over 20 years. Um, I work as a mitigation specialist, so my job is to deal with um, trauma. And I just spend a lot of time in jails and prisons, and I just want to tell you guys a little bit of, about what I see. Um, there's no jobs for people in jails, so their families are bearing the brunt of anything they might need. There's no programming of any kind, and if there is programming, most of the time it's for people that are there for minor offenses. I only work on serious felonies, so all of them are not getting any resources. Um, people are being held in jails waiting for trial upwards of 10 years. And during that time, they're in solitary confinement. And it's not solitary confinement under prison standards, it's jail standards. So often they're only out of their cell three hours a week. Um, there's no photos allowed on the walls. There's no clocks, there's no calendars. There's no book access. TVs are usually on the other side of the room so they can't hear them. They're standing at their cell. There's no radio, so no music, which we know helps people. Um, people are being housed in mental health units despite not having mental health issues. They're let out after 10 p.m. when there's no bus running. It's too late for them to get into a shelter and they're just left on the streets. It's either cold or super hot. Often cells have no windows. There's the horrible food and extremely high commissary, upwards of a dollar plus for top ramen it's out here on the streets would be 15 cents. There's no visits where you can actually hug a loved one. There's no pictures where you can take so that kids aren't growing up without pictures of their mothers and fathers. Uh, there's no consistency with staff. With staff, there's the lack of medical care. If you have a cavity, that often means that you're gonna get your tooth pulled. Um, you can't go and sit, when you do want to actually have programming, you're not allowed to go in the higher level units. Um, there's violence against individuals that people are witnessing all the time. And so I just want to say that uh, we are causing further trauma to people who have already experienced almost all or every adverse childhood experience and community adverse experience. And we need to be doing better. And I hope that you guys really do your job and actually show up for people. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. I have David Duran and after David, I have Brian Goldstein. David? Yes, thank you. Um, David Duran with uh, People's Homeless Task Force, Orange County. And listening to the comments brings brings to mind some questions I'd like to ask, and I, I know that I don't expect you to answer them, but I do expect that you think about them. So how much filth is acceptable in, in the BSCC's oversight? How much filth is allowable inside of a jail? Um, and how many deaths while in custody would be acceptable as a result of um, the treatment within a jail or the neglect within the jail. Um, and how, how and why is the BSCC claiming oversight? Um, it, it should be probably renamed um, to better match what, what it's being recognized for doing. Maybe it should be recognized as a spectator, as, the BSCC performs spectating if they're not going to provide oversight. 
Um, so please strategically create, you know, true oversight and please and 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 enforcement. You know, otherwise rename what you are created to do um, or, or create a public oversight to do the job that the BSCC was created to do. Nonetheless, we're talking about human lives. We're talking about people who are at the mercy of the system that we all know, that we all recognize is not perfect. It is broken. It is created this way. So to ignore that and to then on top of that, ignore the oversight to a point to where, you know, there's filth and inhumane treatment is, um, it, it's obviously not a good thing. And I would hope that somehow way, shape, fashion or form that somebody would feel complicit with the tragedies that are helping that are that are going on within the jails and feels motivated to to do what's right thank you thank you david i have brian goldstein and after brian i have betty fang brian Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. My name is Brian Goldstein. I'm with the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice. In November 2019, we were shocked to learn the full scope of this agency's failure to protect people in jails and juvenile facilities. An investigation by the Sacramento Bee and ProPublica found that a BSEC field inspector visited Kern County's jail in 2018, where people were held for days or weeks without mattresses and toilets. People slept on the floor using yoga mats. The BSEC inspector's report briefly noted these violations. The sheriff responded by buying more yoga mats. We only learned this a year later because of the media's investigation. The BSEC's proposed enhanced inspections process still would not prevent this from happening again. These are mostly superficial changes. There will still be major delays for when the public learns about county noncompliance. Instead, there must be immediate action on these issues. It's still unclear what will happen if a county doesn't address these compliance issues at all. We ask that you remember your responsibility to protect those inside and their families. What I hear tonight from the public is a question. Amid COVID-19, where can Californians go to protect their loved ones inside? We hope you hear those calls for help. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, Betty Fang, and after Betty, I have Elizabeth Ocampo. Um, Betty. Hi, uh, my name is Betty Fang, and I'm providing public comment on behalf of Children's Defense Fund California. So along with a coalition of organizations, we've been monitoring students' education in LA County's Juvenile Hall and Camp Court Schools since March, the onset of the pandemic. We've observed major deficiencies in the amount and quality of education that's been provided to students in these facilities that have largely escaped oversight and are poised to continue indefinitely without intervention. While we have made some progress through local community pressure and advocacy to improve students' access to virtual instruction, much of that progress is again at risk of being undone. We've heard reports that after six months of advocacy to improve virtual instruction implementation, LA County is probably going to be going backwards and again relying only on issuing paper, paper packets to students with no type of virtual interaction or support from instructional staff. The stakes are really high for youth who are still expected to keep up with their education and make progress in their high school credits and preparedness for college and career. 
But under the suspended regulations for education programming and insufficient oversight, students continue to be at risk of missing out on thousands of instructional minutes a week. I'm here today to give input on how BSCC inspectors can better inspect education services during and after COVID-19 and what students and the community need from the BSCC to better protect students' access to education. The three main access issues we've documented are one, facilities continued reliance on issuing paper packets without providing students any type of you know, modification or support that is responsive to their individual learning needs. Two, um, no consistent access to quality virtual instruction or special education services. Um, in LA County, students who are quarantined do not have access to any type of virtual instruction, regardless of, regardless of whether or not other classes um, for, or facilities have digital devices and internet connectivity. And this impacts so many students in LA County, over 500 young people have been quarantined um, since the onset of the pandemic. And just yesterday, there have been reports that currently 200 students are quarantined. So this lasts for over 14 days. And in conversations with staff, we've been told that students are technically under an excused absence uh, when they're being quarantined, uh, which we, th we think is not you know, a reason to provide them substandard education. In fact, they should be given more access to services and um, you know, paper-based or other pre-recorded materials. Um, the third issue is the lack of assessments and data reporting. Um, currently, Regulation 1370B states that supplemental instruction should be afforded to youth who do not demonstrate sufficient progress towards grade level standards. But if staff aren't you know, issuing assessments or monitoring them, um, how do they know which students need supplemental instruction? How are they being given access to this? So the BSCC must ensure county suspensions of regulations in response to COVID-19 are reasonable and necessary, and further review those mitigation plans to ensure they're robust and continually improved and strengthened over time. LEGO's mitigation plan hasn't changed since March 2020. Um, and education regulations can't just be suspended indefinitely. What plan does the BSCC have to ensure that facilities are taking necessary steps to ensure youth can eventually access basic education programming? Two, for data reporting, uh, we feel like the mitigation plan is insufficient on the juvenile facility suspension of standards dashboard. Similar to how data is already collected by the BSCC for its Tableau data dashboard on COVID-19 in juvenile detention facilities, we really recommend that BSCC consider adding onto their data dashboard the following columns to ensure basic provisions of education. One, the number of students receiving academic assessments, Two, the number of youth receiving virtual instruction. Three, the number of youth receiving full 240 minutes of instruction as required by California State Education Code. And number four, the number of youth receiving related services specified under their 504 plan or IEP. We hope that the BSCC will reflect on the urgency required in these unprecedented circumstances and do what it can to ensure youth in the state's care receive the quality of education they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, I have Elizabeth Ocampo, and then I have Bernie Gomez. Good evening. I'm a community member in San Mateo County and advocate with RWC Jail Support. I am here to share that the unsanitary conditions at the McGuire facility in Redwood City and the retaliation against currently incarcerated individuals is unacceptable. There has been two deaths within a 14-day period, one being investigated as a suicide and one of natural causes. Men have been retaliated against because uh, their families decide to speak up about these conditions. Sheriff Bolanos will not return calls or emails and has made comments that such conditions are not happening inside the facilities. So the real question, are you believing a sheriff who has himself been investigated by the FBI or the people inside the facility who have firsthand experiencing these conditions? Conditions are unsanitary. Video visits are not reliable. If salons can be open, why can't families visit their loved ones behind the glass? There has been numerous protests organized by community members and even a 10 day hunger strike to improve these conditions and call for action. The community has done their part, putting thousands of dollars in commissary accounts for folks inside jails and prisons throughout California to have access to basic needs such as soap. I urge you to take real action. Incarcerated people are human. They are important. Help me help them. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
excuse me, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. And I have Bernie Gomez, who will be our last speaker. I want to remind um, everybody that if you'd like to make a comment, a written comment, send it to regulations at bscc.ca.gov. Um, Bernie. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, to the board, Chair. Uh, gracias. Uh, I guess uh, save the best for last, right? No, just playing. You know, actually, I just became empowered, right? Listening to all these uh, strong people, advocates, organizers, right? Folks, relatives, they just speaking truth to power. Uh, and it just, uh, it just, I kind of sparked that, uh, that fire, right? So my name is Bernie Gomez. I am the uh, programs and leadership assistant at MILPA based out of Salinas. I am formerly incarcerated. Uh, I just paroled a year ago from Solano, uh, Solano State Prison, right? Uh, I just uh, discharged. So I'm not too far removed from, uh, from, these, uh, from these conditions, right? From, this, from the setting. Everything that's being said is, uh, it's only scratching the surface. You know, the reality is, uh, if I speak about my story, my journey, right? From San Cruz County to, you know, San Quentin to Solano, it's, it's, it's all gonna say the same thing. It's dirty, right? The, the climate in there with, uh, when it comes to guards, uh, uh, professionalism and uh, uh, just uh, simple treating people with simple dignity and respect, right? It's uh, non-existent. Uh, you wanna talk about uh, the sanitation, right? Uh, uh, process there is like, you know, you might get a bucket of water with a mop you know, you know, smelling maybe like a, 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 a some type of a product, right? Shampoo maybe at that. Uh, you know, there's a it's a it's an incubator to uh, uh, to just uh, uh, um, but just to uh, be a, a, a festering, you know, bacteria, especially you know with COVID nineteen, you know, circulating the uh, the ventilation, having the you know being locked down, all these things, right? Uh, you know, and I've been a part of when the uh, the BSCC has announced that there's inspections that are going to come in, right? I was part of a, a, a cleaning crew, you know, that we weren't told what to do, what it was about, you know, but, you know, not knowing knowing what I know now, right, what I was doing is I was be, I was uh, helping them hide their, uh, hide their uh, atrocities that goes on in there, right? Uh, at the end of the day, you know, so I just want to echo the uh, unannounced inspections, right, recommendation, you know, it's like, the truth is that uh, uh, the BSEC's power, right, uh, must be used, you know, to help people, you know, not to absolve people. Uh, if if you're not part of the solution, then that means that you're part of the problem. You know, it was just said, you know, like, uh, um, you know, are you just are you just okay with with spectating, right? Are you just okay with uh, uh, turning a, bl a blind eye to what's going on? Uh, there's, you know, it's like. I mean, I don't know, it's like, ask yourself, what would Jesus do, right? I mean, the truth is, uh, it's your moral obligation to help uh, uh, people that are struggling, right? Through, uh, uh, through you know, the social, emotional trauma, drama that's going on right now. Um, COVID exacerbates all this, you know, uh, prison climate exacerbates this. Uh, so we're just asking to, uh, help our brothers and sisters live uh, dignified through their journey uh, until they're able to get, you know, get out of it, you know, and, uh, and successfully uh, find themselves and, and be treated as human beings. Um, I just say uh, gracias to all, the, uh, to all the participants here that, are, that, that, that spoke up, you know, and, you know, it's, it's empowering, you know, keep up, you know, siempre adelante. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating and coming out this evening. Um, those are all the speakers that we have in our queue. Um, I've gotten some comments in our regulations um, at the SEC um, email box. Uh, so again, encourage people to submit written comments. And I will um, ask Linda to uh, make any comments and um, wrap us up. Linda? Thanks, Allison, and thanks to everybody. Um, I'm so uh, delighted about the participation. Uh, we hear you. Um, I think uh, we'll work hard to assimilate uh, many of the things you suggest as 
I, uh, I don't think we had much of a dialogue back and forth. There were times I wanted to say something, but this was not the venue to do so. Um, I think um, it's always good to take this in and to uh, remain open to the to many, many uh, stakeholders in this process and do what we can within the uh, sort of the realm of our authority and abilities. And uh, with that, um, I'll say good night and uh, extend my gratitude and hope all of you have a, a, a fabulous holiday and uh, please accept uh, my respect for your um, continued uh, vigilant and uh, attention to issues that are so important to you. So I'm signing off of that. All right, good night all. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.